Good morning. If you will be turning in your Bibles to the book of Genesis. Genesis is where we will be going this morning. Really spending the entire lesson uh, here this morning. It's good to see everyone out this morning. It's good to see uh, those that we have inside. It was good to see a good number outside. We're thankful for the presence of each and every one of you this morning. Thankful for your interest in, uh, in spiritual things. Uh, looking also forward to, to starting this new year with you. Uh, it's the first service that we've had so far in the new year. And we pray that everything that we do this year, we will do to glorify our God. And that He will be praised by our service to Him this year. Challenge that we issued uh, a couple weeks back. Actually, let me go back. A couple weeks back, we had a lesson about the topic of getting into the habit of reading our Bibles uh, every single day. And I challenged you this year to try and make that a habit. Uh, specifically, some of you may even challenge yourself to read the entire Bible in one year. So in 2021, you're going to read the entire Bible in one year. And that, that's a great challenge. Some may start smaller, some may, may go more, but for some, many of you, that's probably what you have decided to do. Specifically for the teens, I've challenged them to read the Bible specifically in chronological order. And I did that intentionally because what I want to do and emphasize this year in our class is I want to make sure that we see the big picture of the Bible. In other words, so we read it in chronological order because I want us to see the story from the beginning up until God's plan is fulfilled there at the end. Because a very common issue that I've found for us, especially those of us that grew up going to our Bible classes, is that you know we learn a lot of the Bible stories without actually understanding how it all fits together. For example, we know the story of creation. We know the story of Noah and the flood. We know the story of David and Goliath, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. All these really interesting stories that on their own tell very powerful lessons. But the question then comes, well, do we understand how all these things fit together in the big picture? So this year, as hopefully we're all starting out reading our Bibles every day, I thought it might be helpful that we give an overview of the periods of Bible history. Because the amazing thing about God's Word is while it seems like it is just a bunch of books that are all bundled together into one volume, in actuality, the Bible tells us the story about God's plan for man's redemption in Christ. You know, we sometimes cringe when we hear the word history. I say periods of Bible history. We don't like that word history. Sorry if you're a history teacher. Because for many times, you know, when we hear that word history, often we associate it with something kind of, something dry, something boring, perhaps. But for us, the Bible tells us the history of God's scheme of redemption. And understanding that the Bible is indeed history, I think what that does for us is it helps us to separate the accounts of the Bible from stories of legend. And understanding how these pieces all fit together, we realize that the Bible is not just stories of legend, but it is the history of God's people. And understanding the history of God's dealing with man, what it does for us is it gives us context to the situation that we find ourselves in today. One tool that's been especially helpful for me over the years is to categorize the events of the Bible into 17 periods of Bible history. You probably heard me throw that out there once before. And this is not my own design. Uh, I'm not the first person to use these periods of Bible history as a tool. Many of you probably have already seen these. You may have even memorized these yourself. And if you have, that's great. Uh, hopefully this lesson will help you. Uh, and hopefully you know, you'll, you'll see you'll learn at least something. But for those of you that haven't, and this is the first time you're seeing these, it is helpful to me. Uh, it's helpful to my family. I think it will be helpful to you as you read your Bibles. Uh, Brother Bob Waldron, who used to preach at Eastside in Athens, he's the one that actually organized the periods of the Bible story into these 17 periods of Bible history that really helped lay out for us the Bible story. And again, I benefited from this, but uh, and I would encourage you as we go through these things to try and commit these things to, me to memory. This morning, I'm going to start with four. You see that we're just doing the book of Genesis. There's four periods in the book of Genesis. We'll start with four. When I first started doing this lesson, I said, I'm going to go through all 17. And then I realized that was way too much. Um, so maybe we'll get multiple lessons out of this. We'll come back to this at some point in the future. But most of you, if you're starting a reading plan right now, you're probably starting in the book of Genesis, whether you're going chronological or, or some other plan. So this is probably a good place for us to start uh, nonetheless. This will get us through for at least two or three weeks uh, in, in our reading plans. 
So the first title for our periods of Bible history really doesn't make total sense until you get to the second period of Bible history. The second period of Bible history I'm going to go ahead and tell you is the flood. So that'll make it easier to remember the first one, which is before the flood. Now, Brother Waldron in his workbooks actually, he labels it a couple of different ways. He labels it either creation, creation stories, but he also labels it before the flood. And I like before the flood because this period really covers a lot more than just creation. So imagine for a second, imagine the beginning of this story. No earth, no universe, no physical life. And the Bible starts out there at the beginning of the book of Genesis, in the beginning. Not in the sense that this was God's beginning, because God is eternal. But in the beginning for us, it refers to the beginning of God's physical creation. Now obviously, creation is the first major event that that occurs before the flood. God created the physical universe that we live in, that we uh, you know, can see around us today. He created light. He created the atmosphere. He created the living things that are on earth. He created the sun, the moon, and the stars. He created also, on, on one of those days, He created man. And it was noted in that passage that man was different than any of the rest of the living creatures. Because man was made, it says in chapter 1 and verse 26, in God's image. Man was able to reason. Man, was, uh, man had a soul, for example. Man is the only being that has the capacity to serve God's will and mold themselves to His image. God, in creating mankind, He created both male and female, and they were perfect companions for each other. We see in the story of creation that God put man, He put them in the Garden of Eden to manage the garden. And in the garden, there were several things, but one thing in particular was the fact that there was the tree of life. Of course, also in the garden, there was another tree. There was a tree that they were told not to eat of. That was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And they were warned not to eat of that tree or else they would surely die. That was the warning. Man was created to serve God. And the point that we see here in creation, especially with man, was that this service to God, it was not going to be some mindless service. Man was going to be able to choose. And those trees represented the choice of being able to choose. And then we get into Genesis chapter 3 and we see that man chooses wrong. We see that mankind was tempted by Satan and man was turned against the Lord and they rebelled against His will that He had given them. Thus, in Genesis chapter 3, sin enters the world. Man was given several curses and he was even removed from the garden that he was placed in. And perhaps the most significant point of that part of that, you know, those curses and being taken out of the garden was the fact that their access to the tree of life was removed. Now there is a problem. And it seems like at this point that Satan has won. You know, however, even within Genesis chapter 3, when it seems like Satan has won, there is a promise of a Savior. Man has sinned. Man would face death because of sin. However, we see that Satan has not won yet. He had merely dealt a, a very small blow. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, we see that the Lord tells Satan, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Yes, man, it's sin. But God had a plan to redeem mankind. This is the first instance where we see this being mentioned. In Genesis chapter 3, we have the first glimmer of hope of this plan for our redemption. Now as time progresses, we get into chapter 4 and 5. We see that sin, you know, it starts in 3, but it doesn't just go away. Some would be faithful to the Lord, but of course some would not be as well. Genesis chapter 4, we have the example of Adam and Eve's sons, Cain and Abel. And Cain killed his own brother Abel. So the first murder that we have recorded in Scriptures is found here in Genesis chapter 4. And why does it happen? Because of sin. That's why. Cain is sent away, but yet another son is born. His name was Seth. And that's where our story continues. We see in chapter 5 that the years pass, mankind continues to grow in number. Several generations pass where men would live hundreds of years, but what most of them have in common, with the exception of Enoch, was that they died. Why was that? It's because of sin. Going back to Genesis chapter 3. Methuselah is listed as one that lives the longest, at least as far as the records that we have. 969 years he lived. He had a son named Lamech, who then had a son that we know, Noah. 
Noah himself is also mentioned to have three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. So that concludes the, the first period of Bible history before the flood. That goes through chapter 5. Now, of course, if the first period is, is referred to as before the flood, then naturally the second one should be easy for us to remember, and that is the period known as the flood. And that covers from chapter 6 through chapter 9. Now, the story of the flood is perhaps one of the most best known events in the Bible. Why? Because it's a pretty impressive story. It's quite an epic story when you consider because what happens is something that for us is just very difficult for us to imagine. Now in verses 1-7 through seven of chapter 6, while sin entered the world back in chapter 3, again we see that things just progressively get worse up until the point where we get to chapter 6 where the Lord looked out, He looked over the world, and He saw that mankind was so wicked that every intention of His heart was wicked. See that in verse 5 of chapter 6. However, in verse 8, we see that there was one who found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Noah. He was a man of righteousness. He was faithful to the Lord. And God gives Noah instructions there at the last part of chapter 6 to build an ark because he is going to destroy the world in a flood. God had Noah. God had Noah's family. He had him take some of every type of animal. He took all those onto the ark to spare them. We saw in chapter 2 of Genesis that death was the only deserving penalty for sin. Thus, because of the sin, the sinfulness of mankind, God brings this worldwide flood that He promised back to Noah. He brings this worldwide flood that He's going to destroy all the living creatures on the face of the earth. And all living creatures that weren't spared by the ark died in the flood. Actually, if you do the math, even Methuselah, it seems like, died in the flood, even though he was mentioned in the genealogies. Genesis chapter 8, Noah and his family, they leave the ark. And then when you get to chapter 9, we see that God makes a covenant with mankind. God says that He is never again going to destroy the world with a flood. And a rainbow is going to be the sign of this. So at this point in history, because of sin, Noah and his family are the only, only living of mankind on the face of the earth. It's kind of neat for us to think about the fact that all of us today are descendants from Noah and his family. That's pretty neat. And it's all because of sin. So this ends the period, uh, you know, at the end of chapter 9, we see the death of Noah. And this ends the period that we know of as the flood. Now as you get into Genesis chapter 10 and 11, we get to one that was a little bit shorter, at least as far as the text is concerned. And that is the third period of Bible history, which is the scattering of the people. Genesis chapter 10, we see the generations that follow Noah, each coming from each of the three sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. You know, it's easy kind of for us to go through this genealogy and just kind of brush through these names, but understand that what's happening here is generations are passing, mankind is developing again. And then it mentions one particular story of interest in chapter 11. Because we see sometime after Noah, all of mankind at one point in time they were all together in one place. They all spoke the same language. And there was a problem. Because of their wickedness this time, it says that they were trying to build this tower because they were trying to make a great name for themselves. And God at this point in time decided that it was time He needed to intervene or there was going to be further problem. He changed their languages and they were dispersed all over the face of the earth. So now, the, the story starts to focus in primarily on one of Noah's descendants. So there was Shem, Ham, and Japheth. But now we're going to focus on the descendants of one in particular. And that's Shem. So the, the generations pass until you get to a man named Terah. And then more specifically, you get to a man, his son, Abraham. Or Abram, as he is called at this point in time. And that concludes the, the third period of Bible history. So in Genesis chapter 12, and this really takes us through the end of the book of of Genesis, we, we now enter the fourth period of Bible history that we're going to call the patriarchs. And four main figures drive the rest of the outline of the book of Genesis. And even though, I, I want you to understand, even though all four of these guys are very important figures in the history of God's people, again, I don't want you to lose sight of the fact that we are talking about the big picture, God's plan for man's redemption. Yes, these men are important, but again, God has a plan. And He's working through these men and He's going to keep doing that. 
In Genesis chapter 12, we are introduced again to a very special figure in the Bible story, and that, of course, is we, we know him as Abraham, but of course he's going by Abram when we first meet him. God tells Abram to leave his home, go to a place that he was going to show him. And then at the beginning of in Genesis chapter 12, we see a very important section when we're talking about the big picture of the Bible, God's plan for man's redemption. A lot of this is promised here to Abraham here at the beginning of chapter 12. We see the, the promises are given to Abraham, but there are three main ones in regards to the Bible story that I want to pull out. God was going to make from Abraham a great nation. He was going to bless Abraham's offspring with this land that God was going to show him. So there was a great nation. There was a land promise. But then thirdly, he says through him, in other words, through his offspring, all the families of the earth were going to be blessed. And you could say that in many ways from Genesis 12 onward, the Bible shows us the fulfillment of these promises to Abraham. This is a really key point in Scripture that we need to take note of if we have not already. Now just looking at these promises, as you're reading the Bible story up until this point, for us mere mortals, there are some pretty big problems with these promises. Abraham and his wife Sarah were older at this point. They didn't have kids at this point. And at this point, they were really too old in man's terms for kids. Not to mention the fact that the second promise, the land promise, the problem with that was that there was already people living in the land. So two big problems that we see right off the bat. And then the last promise, uh, the blessings to all nations, again, it's not something that perhaps was very evident or completely understood at this time. But as we, as the story will continue to unfold, just like with Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, just like we see it indicate, God had a plan to defeat Satan and to bless all of mankind. And this time we're told more specifically, more detail, this is going to happen through Abraham's lineage. And this great nation, this land promise that he's given, given, that's all part of the plan that God has to redeem mankind. Now by a miracle, God uh, you know, had Abraham's wife, she conceived, and she bore a child. According to human logic, this child should not have been born, but it was. God's plan for mankind made it happen. It had to happen for God's plan. Then we move forward to the second patriarch, Abraham's child of promise. Again, that shouldn't have been born, but God's plan made it happen. His name was Isaac, and he is the second figure in this part of the text. Abraham beco or Isaac becomes the head of the family, and we see in Genesis chapter 26 that God reiterates the same promises that he gave to Abraham. Back in Genesis chapter 12, he reiterates them to his son Isaac. Isaac had twin sons. Esau and Jacob were their names. And even though technically Esau was the eldest, we see in the text that Jacob was going to be the greater of the two. And the Bible story actually continues through his son Jacob. In Genesis chapter 28, we see that God reiterated the same promises that were made to Abraham and to Isaac. He now reiterates them to Jacob. Jacob's name would also later be changed to Israel. Jacob was blessed with 12 sons, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Dan, Naphtali, Gad, Asher, Issachar, Zebulun, Joseph, and Benjamin. He also had a daughter named Dinah. We don't talk about her as much. But, so he had 12 sons and then a daughter named Dinah. So the great nation was starting a little bit slow, but now with 12 sons, we're starting to ramp up just a little bit. The 12 sons that Jacob had would be the start of the nation of Israel. That's where that name comes from, where Jacob's name was changed to Israel. That's where we get that name. So, so far... The patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, all three of them so far have been in the lineage of Christ. However, as we get into the end of the book of Genesis, now our focus is going to turn to someone else in the family, but not in the lineage of Christ. But he's also still a very important character. Jacob, of course, had 12 sons that we mentioned from four different women, but it was his son of his favorite wife, Rachel, that was his personal favorite. And Joseph is that son. And Joseph, as we'll see, is also the primary focus of the last part of Genesis. Joseph, he was sold by his jealous brothers. He was sold by, by his brothers into slavery in Egypt. But this too was part of God's plan. Doesn't seem like it, maybe. Maybe there were some questions. How does he find himself in prison? How does he find himself in this situation? Again, it was part of God's plan. And we're going to see how it benefited his people. As a slave, God helped Joseph. He gets to the point where he is able to manage the famine that comes on the land, not only to save Egypt, 
But in managing it in Egypt, he also saves people from the surrounding areas, including his own family who had sold him. This garnered uh, Joseph's favor among the Egyptians, which very importantly also allowed him to bring his family to Egypt, specifically to the land of Goshen. This is a very important part. Sometimes we brush over this. But the fact that he was bringing them to Goshen was a very important part to the Bible story. Because in Goshen, this family was going to be allowed to grow, develop. They were going to grow a number, of course. But more specifically in Goshen, because of the nature of their, their occupation being shepherds, they were also going to be able to keep separate from those that were around them. And of course, we mentioned that Joseph is not of the lineage of Christ. But seeing what Joseph does here at the end of Genesis, hopefully you see why Joseph is so vital to God's plan. But more specifically towards God's plan, at least as far as Christ is concerned, we see in chapter 49 that Jacob, we see the story of him calling his sons to himself and he's blessing them before he dies. And one thing that he says in verse 10 of chapter 49, he says, The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until tribute comes to him. And to him shall be the obedience of the people. Now we listed the sons pretty quickly just now, and Judah is not the oldest. we got to understand that. He is not the eldest. Reuben was the oldest. But it says here in this passage that the scepter is not going to depart from Judah until tribute, or Shiloh comes, depending on your translation. This is a Messianic reference. And as we continue through the Bible story, we're going to see that it is Judah that is going to take the lead when we get into the land. It is Judah often that we find leading the people out in the wilderness, at least that tribe. And it is through Judah, this is the most important part, it is through Judah through whom the lineage of Christ is going to come. So that verse is is very important to the big picture of the Bible story. So as the period of the patriarchs is closing, God's people, we're still in the early stages. Again, we're only four periods into Bible history. About 70 to 75 of Jacob's descendants come to the land of Egypt to dwell in Goshen. At this point in time, at the end of Genesis, they're in favor. You know, the Egyptians are find favor in them because of their respect from Joseph. However, as we continue to the next period of Bible history, we're going to see there's a bad turn that takes, at least in some respects. But it was also part of God's plan. So as we get into the next section of history, again, we're going to see these people have greatly multiplied, but their situation has greatly changed. They are now in oppression. This is where we'll leave off for sake of time here this morning. So, so far, we have covered these four periods. Before the flood, the flood, scattering of the people, and patriarchs. I've got those on the handouts. If you've got a handout, please take that home. Read over it. Memorize those four. You don't have to memorize the entire thing. Just memorize those four. I promise you it's going to help. The other parts will will come in. Uh, You know, you might think, well, perhaps this lesson probably would have been a little more appropriate for a Bible class. And and maybe so. Because generally in sermons, we tend to focus on facts of the gospel, on doctrine and things of that nature. But my goal as a preacher is also to help you with God's Word. Help teach you God's Word. And hopefully going through these periods of Bible history... And working through these things is going to help realize, as we read our Bibles every day, it's going to help us realize how even these stories back in the book of Genesis, how these things connect to the Gospel story. God had a plan, and His plan was Christ. And the Bible tells us the history, tells us the development of His plan through the years. And it tells us one of the most beautiful, most impressive stories that you will ever hear. So, so far we've seen just so far in these periods of Bible history, we've seen the fact that man sinned. And as a result of their sin, they separated themselves from God. They separated themselves from God. They separated themselves from the tree of life. And now because of those things, death is a reality for mankind. Sin is a very serious thing. We see all that demonstrated with the flood. Because of sin, there was a worldwide flood that that got rid of all living creatures aside from Noah and his family who were righteous. But we also see that God had a plan to defeat Satan. He had a plan to defeat Satan and bless mankind. It was prophesied to the serpent back in Genesis chapter 3. It was promised to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. And it was also prophesied to Jacob's sons in Genesis chapter 49. Praise be to God this morning that He has a plan for us, His people. And as we continue overviewing God's plan for mankind throughout all these historical periods of Bible history, 
I really hope that you see God's plan working because it works. Only God could do what He did. I want to close by asking you a question. Are you here today? And are you not a Christian? Again, I realize that this lesson this morning has been more of a history lesson, but hopefully you understand that God has implemented His plan. It is in, it is in force today. And His plan to redeem you from sin and to save you from that faith that sin would result in, which is death. Again, that's offered to us today. Because of God's plan in Christ, you can submit your life to Him. You can become a Christian by putting your trust in Him, by repenting of your sins, by being willing to confess Him before others, and by being baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. And if you have not done that, do not neglect to see God's plan for you to save you from your sin. This morning, if you are subject to the invitation, come forward as we stand and as we sing. I want to thank you for your kind attention to today's lesson. And if you're ever in the area of North Alabama, the brethren here at Ardmore would certainly love to have you visit with us. If the lesson here was helpful for you, we would appreciate you sharing it with others, share it on social media or email it, however you want to do that. And if you'd like to receive future lessons, you can subscribe to us on YouTube and Facebook, and you'll receive notifications when new lessons are posted. I want you to know that the brethren here love you, but most importantly, God loves you. And if we can help you in your walk with Christ, we would certainly love the opportunity to do so.